This is the first Tuesday of the month Wapaka City Council meeting. To our regular scheduled City Council meeting. Today is September 5th, 2017, and it is 6 p.m. I call this meeting to order, and let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll ask Sandy to read the clerk's open meeting statement for us. This meeting and all other meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the press in accordance with Wisconsin State statutes so that the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. And take roll for us, Sandy. Brian Smith. Here. Steve Hackett. Here. Lori Chestnut. Paul Hagen. Alan Keeland. Here. Scott Prochatsky. Here. Dave Peterson. Here. Paul Mayo. Here. Chuck Whitman. Here. Mary Fair. Here. And Eric Olson. Here. Eight present. We have a quorum. Important to know that uh, Paul and Lori have both called in and said they were unable to attend tonight. So <coughs> we are at full uh, for what we expected tonight. Uh, consent agenda that's uh, in your packet. Uh, these are items that we will vote on with one motion. There's a number of items in there. Any items that council would like to see moved to the regular agenda where you vote on those with uh, one motion for each of those items? If there is, uh, let me know at this time. If not, we need a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda as printed. So, second. Motion by Hackett, second by Keelan that we approve the consent agenda as printed. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, uh, motion carried. Regular agenda, Sandy, you had one. Under announcements and correspondence letter A, number one, a corrected proclamation was distributed, and that's all. Okay, and that's a proclamation that we'll read right after this. Um, nothing else uh, for the good of the meeting tonight. Uh, we need... Uh, a motion to approve the regular agenda. So moved. Nope. Second. Motion by Fair. Second by Whitman that we approve the regular agenda with that one addition. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Motion carried. Now let's go on to non-agenda items and announcements. Let's start with that uh, proclamation that uh, Sandy had told you about. Um, this is a proclamation dealing with the uh, Wapaka Area Chamber of Commerce, and I will read that. Um, it's a, a proclamation from the office of the mayor. Whereas the Wapaka Area Chamber of Commerce has been serving the Wapaka area since 1931, and whereas the chamber provides a wide variety of services to their members, including advocacy, economic development, and whereas the chamber promotes tourism and events, and whereas the chamber works to solve critical economic challenges, including labor shortages and encourages entrepreneurship, and whereas the chamber is a critical partner and problem solver with the unique ability to work with stakeholders from both the private and public sectors, and whereas the chamber does not always receive the recognition and credit they deserve for making the Wapaka area a better place to live, work, play, and visit. Now, therefore, I, Brian Smith, Mayor of the City of Wapaka, do hereby proclaim September 2017 as Wapaka Area Chamber of Commerce Month. Throughout the Wapaka area, and I commend the observance to all our citizens. This is in testimony aware of uh, Mayor Brian Smith. And I know we have Terry and uh, Paul Shroud here. Uh, to uh, accept the proclamation that we've made. And Terry, Paul, either one of you, comments that you would like to make? <laughs> nice and short, we like that. I did sign the proclamation, so we can get that to you. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay. On next on our agenda then is public input. Uh, this is for non-agenda items. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to give uh, uh, some discussion on a non-agenda item, please step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record, and keep it to three minutes or less. Okay, my name is Hanna Bukevich, and I live at one, 115 East Fulton Street here in Wapaka. Good evening, council members, and thank you for, in advance for allowing me time to speak before you. Again, my name is Hanna Bukevich, and I am here today to speak on behalf of my family with regard to the Oz Natural Area. This week marks the 20th anniversary of my grandfather's death when my parents decided to channel their grief into something positive for the future by donating pristine land to the city. That fall was a particularly difficult year for them as they were also grieving the death of their good, good friend Nancy Salen, Opaca nurse who had been instrumental in bringing my father, a young physician, and mother to the community. In order to cope with their losses, they made a decision to create the Oz Natural Area that would also permanently protect the founding segment of the River Ridge Trail. It was their wish to create an environmental safe haven for wildlife spreading their love of the natural world, provide a place for outdoor recreation, and to educate fellow community members about the importance of land stewardship. Unfortunately, their memorial donation, do, donation has resulted in immense pain. Stress has weighed heavily on my family for more than 15 years as they have struggled to uncover the truth and understanding for how things have gone so wrong. In 2004, they went into mediation and accepted a promise that things would get better if they gave the city a second chance. Though they still had unanswered questions for a time, they seemed better, but then things began to deteriorate again. Troubling information became apparent, as did the realization that our family no longer had confidence in the city's commitment to the vision and intent outlined in the restrictive covenants contained in the deed at the time of transfer. We share our story not out of a desire to cause harm or embarrassment to anyone, but to convey the depth of our sorrow and desire for closure. To remediate the harm caused to our family's physical and emotional health, we hope you will support the recommendations of staff from the city and the Department of Natural Resources who are now working to have the land returned to us. After lengthy delays, we understand this matter is now scheduled to be taken up by you as part of the agenda for the September 19th City Council meeting. And it's in, it is my hope that you will vote in favor of the return of the natural area to us this fall so that we can finally begin to, the process of healing. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sophia Bukevich, and I live at 124 East Lake Street here in Wapaka. So, good evening, council members, and thank you for this opportunity to, to speak before you. Two of the core values that my parents have instilled in me throughout my childhood are to always exercise patience and kindness. For the past 15 years, my parents have done nothing but that, despite disappointments and conflicts involving the Oz natural area. We all had high hopes that this land would be a haven, a place of adventure and solace for everyone in, this, in our community as it has been and continues to be for us. My parents have spent endless hours making phone calls, um, poring over records, as well as meeting with community members and attorneys to ensure that the land was being treated as the restrictive covenants in the property title outline. The records show that these covenants at times have been ignored and have resulted in the exploitation of Oz, as well as my parents. As I have gotten older and watched my parents struggle to maintain their vision, I have learned how important research is. The answers are written in these records. I implore you to reference these accounts as you consider the situation with Oz. It is the only way you, yourself, can gauge the situation accurately and formulate your own opinion. The only way we can move forward is if we solve the issues of the past. That is all myself, and most importantly, my parents and sisters want, is to move forward and have closure. As a family, we have decided that the best way to ease the pains of the past is through the return of Oz to our family. My sisters and I are all committed stewards of the land, and we will see to it that it is not mistreated in any respects. We have vowed to manage Oz following the vision my parents established before I was even born. We see no greater way to honor them. Should you have any questions of my sisters or I regarding the impact and stress this situation has caused on our family, we would be more than happy to speak at a later time. Thank you.
Good evening, members of the Wapaka City Council. My name is Kari Esbenson. I am the mother of Han and Sophia. I reside at 124 East Lake Street. And I apologize, I've got a bit of a hoarse voice tonight. I've been suffering for a cold. So um, if you're having troubles understanding me, um, bear with me. A philanthropic relationship between an organization who depends upon the goodwill of people and those who give of themselves voluntarily and not by mandate is a special one. It relies upon integrity, respect, and sensitivity to core values that have inspired the gift from the benefactors to the recipient. It requires what professionals in the field of philanthropy identify as the highest of ethics and transparency. In December of 2015, we received confirmation following an open records request that a key part of that sacred contract between us, the donors, and a staff member from the, Wapaka, the city of Wapaka, who also held a position on the Wapaka Air Park Foundation, had been violated just a few months after we had donated our land in 1997. When we donated our land, we placed restrictive covenants on the deed that would guide the management of the property into perpetuity. These covenants could not be removed from the deed unless we, the donors, had given our consent through a notarized letter and signatures stating as such. Nevertheless, the former Parks and Recreation Director wrote a letter to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources while pursuing $52,500 in state money saying that we had agreed to take off the restrictions and the property was appraised without those restrictions. This was a complete falsehood. Additionally, in December of 2015, following our open records request, our attorney discovered that the restrictive covenants had been omitted from the Section B portion of the title insurance policy provided by the city um, to the state as part of its grant request, while other encumbrances were noted. According to the Office of the Commissioner of Insurance, willful omission of the, those covenants without a notarized letter from us would constitute a violation of Wisconsin's insurance law. These are only two... Um, uh, excuse me. How such an omission, omission could have occurred has not been sufficiently explained by First American Title Company, the company that provided the title insurance to the city. Further, notes and support documentation required by law to be maintained in their file that might explain such an omission have been deprived from us on the grounds that they belong to the city. While we have been told the title company would release them to the city, city staff and legal counsel have re refused to request them, forcing us to register open records complaints with the Wapaka County District Attorney's Office and the Wisconsin Office of the Commissioner of Insurance. There's no, nothing more difficult than coming before you tonight to share these facts with you. We are seeking assistance in recovery of these records from you tonight on the grounds that they belong to the taxpaying citizens of this community of which we are a part. All we have ever sought was the truth and the expectation that people honor commitments they have made in good faith and in accordance with the law. Good evening, council members. My name is Russ Butkowitz, and I reside at 124 East Lake Street. Thank, thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes of your time. In 1997, my family transferred the property, now known as the Oz Natural Area, to the city of Wapaka via the Wapaka Area Parks Foundation in the hope that it would be wisely managed for the health of the natural area as well as the use and enjoyment of all the citizens of Wapaka. Unfortunately, there have been many violations of the restrictive covenants that were placed on the property at the time of the transfer, as well as a series of broken promises along the way. Rather than a source of enjoyment and pride, it has become a source of ongoing, immense emotional distress for my family for many years, as well as countless hours of work trying to defend our, vis our vision of the natural area. We are exhausted. As such, we will be formally requesting the return of the property to us on the uh, September 19th council meeting. As part of the information packet that you will be receiving, there will be a historical summary of the events related to the property that have led us to this request. I realize this is not an everyday request and respectfully ask that you review the information carefully to more fully understand our viewpoint. If you have questions or need additional information, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Any other public comment? I'm not sure exactly why you uh, came to this meeting because we agreed and it's fine, it's an open session and we allowed you to speak tonight, but 
we had already agreed that we would put this on the council agenda for the second meeting in September. Uh, so your request is that we hear this and make a decision, and that's exactly what we're going to do at our next meeting. So again, as I've said through many, many years of talking to both of you, I'm trying to do what's best for you and for the city, and I seem to be keep hitting roadblocks. And the thing that I keep remembering most is a divorce, and that's what I feel this is, and uh, I'm not going to argue every point that you have in there, but I have to uh, caution counsel that uh, you're only hearing one side of it. Um, I'm not sure that it really needs to be brought out uh, what the other side is, to tell you the truth, because ultimately the goal is what we've talked about for quite a while now, that they would like to have the Oz property back in their name, and, and I don't know that anything more needs to be said. Um, Obviously, if you have questions of them, you can ask them. And if you have questions of us, uh, staff members that were around, um, this is even predates me a, a little bit, quite honestly. Um, but uh, a lot of this stuff has been stuff that we've discussed uh, over the time. So at our uh, meeting, in, uh, our second meeting in September, uh, John Hart is... Uh, agreed to take a look at this and, and make a recommendation to city and, and give us a couple of options of recommendations that we should uh, look at uh, in moving forward with this. So, um, as I said, uh, this is uh, something that we are taking seriously and uh, we understand that it's a concern and we understand that they're hurt and feel that we've done an injustice to them, but we're trying to do the best we can by by uh, what they've requested for as far as receiving the property back. Okay? Let's move on then. Uh, one more announcement I'd like to make tonight, and uh, that uh, is a congratulations to uh, coach of the Wapaka Lakemen. Uh, they just won their grand championship. I think it's your 15th grand championship that uh, Lakeman would have. You want to tell us a little bit about it? <laughs> Very briefly, the, uh, the whole association has been in existence for 72 years, and uh, it's about 30, 26 to 30 teams from four divisions, and we have a playoff at the end of the year in each division, and then go on, came towards like a World Series or came like the Final Four in basketball. And, well, back in now we won yesterday or Sunday. That's our 15th time in 72 years. It's, it's pretty hard to do, and Clintonville's at 14, so they're very close. But two bigger cities have uh, kind of dominated a little bit. But I would certainly like to thank all the, uh, particularly the Park and Rec for taking care of the field as well as they do. It's just a beautiful field for a small town, and it handled over, well, probably over 700 people on Sunday were there. With extra porta potties and things set up, and a volunteer from the fire department came and set up an extra concession stand. And uh, we, we thank all the people for their support and uh, all the businesses in the community that have helped donate and support prizes, etc. As we ask throughout the year, very generous community. We're proud of our accomplishment, we thank everybody as well. Thank you, absolutely. I think it deserves a round of applause. <laughs> I, I was kidding a, a little bit. Uh, I went to, I didn't see the grand championship game, but I've seen many of the games o over this year and over the years, and it cost two dollars. Two dollars to go watch a nine inning game. You can't get a better deal than that. Uh, I think we ended up uh, with uh, the game before the grand championship. It was tied 1 1 going into the 10th inning, and uh, Luke Bain, I think it was, came up in the bottom of the 10th inning and first pitch and hit a home run over the center field fence t to win the game. So it was pretty cool. For $2, you can't beat that. So thanks. All right, let's uh, move on then. Uh, we have uh, unfinished business. This is the Deer Management Committee, and I know uh, Alan got something to tell us. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, give a brief update. We met again on August 29th. 
and uh, finalize the rules for the hunt. <clears throat> Talked a bit about uh, trying to find a coordinator for you. We've not had any volunteers come forward. Um, so we were contemplating perhaps using city employees, um, but that has not been decided yet either. Um, I think some of you may have seen the uh, article in the paper last week's County Post West, uh, where we talked about the program again, um, and also outlined what the rules are for the non-managed hunt. In other words, what bow hunters can do on their own without uh, having to have city permission to do it. Um, also, just uh, tonight I signed letters to 28 of the um, property owners within the city limits, uh, outlining again the deer hunt program and uh, uh, making sure they know that people can hunt their lands outside of the city-sponsored uh, deer hunt. We have agreed not to meet again unless uh, something comes up that would cause us to, and so uh, right now we're just in limbo subject to call. Any questions? So, uh, just FYI, too, the uh, bow hunting season actually does open, I think, next week, September Saturday. 7th. Yes. What is it? 7th. Oh, it is the 7th. Right. 16th. Or 16th, I'm sorry. Yeah, 16th. Yeah, it ends. Okay. So, it's yeah. next, a week from Saturday that it opens up. And uh, so, uh, I don't know. I mean, they people can bow hunt within the city. There are some restrictions. Uh, if they do want to bow hunt within the city, they have to get uh, a permit from the police department. Brian, you want to help me out here a little bit? They do. Um, we have an ordinance that prohibits people from discharging um, bows in the city. However, if they do get a $10 bow permit, that allows them to target practice in their backyards and also allows them to um, to hunt um, in the city if they're if they shoot their bow. So, and it's ten dollars, and it's good for two years. Okay. Again, that would be the hunting part would only be during actual deer bow hunting season, though. Correct. Yes, they have to abide by all um, state DNR guidelines um, that normal hunting would apply. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alan, sure. Brian. Thank you. License report number 1382. This is an operator's license. It's on uh, page 51. Move to approve license report number 1382. Motion by Keelan, second by Olson that we approve the license report number 1382. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Uh, next, uh, we're asking that uh, you allow us to go, allow council to go into closed session uh, in accordance with uh, state statutes. We need a motion to do that. So moved. Motion by Keela and second by, I'm sorry, Dave Peterson, that uh, we convene into closed session in accordance with section 19.85, parent 1, parent G of the Wisconsin state statutes as it concerns conferring with legal counsel for the government bo governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is or is likely to become involved. Is it getting easier for me to read or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Sandy will take the roll. Eric Olson. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. And Dave Peterson. Eight ayes. Motion carried. Okay. Um, I don't. I go back and forth as much as I can. That's me. Okay, we all set? We are back in open session. We had uh, some discussion in closed session, and uh, council is, I think, prepared to make a couple of motions. So I'll open up the floor, um, I guess, uh, to, to uh, one of the two motions that we talked about. 
We would like to make a motion that we approve the memorandum of understanding between the city of Wapaka and Wapaka County. Second. Motion by Hackett, second by Keelan that we enter into a memorandum of understanding with the city of Wapaka and Wapaka County uh, and that's stated on the letter that uh, uh, the taxes and 25% of the interest would uh, be paid and, but, and also deferred until the lots are sold. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Steve Hackett. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. And Chuck Whitman. Aye. Eight ayes. Motion carried. Okay, and then uh, one more motion that would clean up the uh, closed session would be to agree to the settle the settlement I'll make a motion we agree to the settlement that it, what that was just discussed I Should second. I say between yeah. I'm sorry go ahead Should I say who it's between or no? Sure you can Between the city and Jerry Lyons Okay Okay so motion by Hackett let's make sure I get it right here Motion by Hackett second, second by Keelan that we Agree to the settlement between the city of Wopaka and Jerry Lyons uh, for an amount of $50,000 and uh, also includes 20 of the lots uh, that are on a map that we have that have to do with the Woodland Estate uh, uh, property. How's that, John? Not going to get yelled at? Okay. All right. Everybody understand? And that was your motion, Steve, and second? Yes. Alan, yes. does that sound right? Okay. Uh, any other discussion on that? Sandy will call the roll. Mary Fair. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Eight ayes. Motion carried. Okay, um, that's it for closed session. Nothing for, well, one thing for the uh, discussion, uh, the mayor, make sure you understand we have a committee of the whole meeting coming up, so don't get up after our council meeting is over. We have to move forward into that. Um, so we'd be looking at a motion to adjourn. Motion by Olson. Second by Peterson that we adjourn till our next regular scheduled meeting on September 19, 2017, subject to call. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. We are adjourned uh, at uh, 6.58 p.m. You guys want a break or you want to just go right into the committee of the whole? I need a take short break. break. Okay, let's take a short break. Five minutes. I'm ready, Kath, when you are. We are back in uh, open session again here. We recessed. Uh, oh, we haven't started the committee of the whole, have we? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Sandy. Will you? You're on. All right. Okay, we are now going to the committee of the whole meeting. I call that meeting to order. In attendance, we have Peterson Olson, Mayo Whitman, Hackett, Mayor Smith, uh, Keelan Prochatsky, and Fair, and also staff members. Uh, we need an approval of the agenda, which is the fiscal 2018 capital improvement plan. Move to approve. Motion by Keelan. Second. Second by Hackett that we approve the agenda as printed. Any discussion? I think, again, it's important to remember it is a committee. The whole meeting, we're not asking for decisions tonight. We're, they're just giving you information to help you when we when the budget is actually presented to you in October. <coughs> okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Against? Motion carried. Uh, Kathy, you're up. Okay. 
Uh, in your packet, I provided you with the 2018-2022 capital improvement plan uh, that was pre um, given to me by each of the departments. Uh, this is their request. I did not move anything uh, because I've um, made it work. Um, one of the goals on, on this capital improvement plan is, is that we uh, maintain uh, a debt service levy of no more than the prior year. So we are at 1.3 million um, for tax levy for debt service. And this plan uh, continues that. Uh, so um, again, there's the introduction. It's the same introduction. Uh, explaining the projects and the software that we use for the um, capital improvement and how each each project is funded and um, prioritized and this is the one that I First page is going to be your expenditures, uh, each department, uh, and uh, the sources uh, that we plan on using to fund uh, these these uh, capital improvement projects. Uh, we are looking at 1.6 million of airport improvements, of which 80% uh, of these is are funded by the Board of Aeronautics. Um, so we only have a 20% match on these projects. Um, the City Hall Library Building has 107,000. Uh, IT is a continuing 10,000 uh, each year of uh, computer upgrades. Um, we do that on a borrowing uh, to make it fit within the budget. Um, park and Recs, uh, Police Department, Police Building, Public Library, um, rec center, building, street department, street rehab program. The transit uh, has taxi replacements it ha is requesting uh, wastewater treatment, water department, and Wapaka online. And the sources are um, some equipment reserves, uh, the airport fund, uh, Bureau of Aeronautics funding, clean water uh, fund loan, federal and state trust, uh, transit grants, uh, the general fund, um, geo bonds, uh, which is going to be for Main Street in 2020 or in 2021, uh, grants. Um, based on departments uh, writing for different grants, uh, some equipment reserve funds for uh, IT from uh, the P card rebate, uh, library donations, um, LRIP funding, local road improvement fund uh, from the state, uh, some operating funds, which will probably be from the utilities, uh, police equipment reserve funds, again, the um, uh, build up of P card and, and um, uh, trade in values or sales of equipment, uh, private donations, uh, revenue bonds from the for the utilities, uh, safe drinking water loan funds, state trust fund loan, um, a one year note um, for uh, equipment that's uh, either under um, ten or twenty thousand. Um, or the squad cars, and then the street uh, using some of their uh, rebate and um, uh, sale of equipment funds. So those are our sources that we have to fund the project. 
And in 18, we are looking at $3.8 million worth of projects. And we are looking at, in 19, $3.3 .3 million worth of projects. And in 2020, we're only looking at 1.84 at this point in time. But then again, um, knowing that we're going to see uh, Main Street, uh, we are looking at 5.4 million in 2021. Um, so we are looking at in this plan of about um, 17 or 18 million dollars worth of improvements to the city and funding those. So the next the next document gives you each department and the projects that they have for each year and their source of funding. So you can see um, where um, in 1818, we are looking to do a reconstructive runway 1331 at the airport and the terminal area and runway development uh, at the airport and using Bureau of Aeronautics funding, uh, we will need to come up with 82,500 to do $1.6 million for the projects. Um, I'm going to ask each of the departments um, to give a brief overview of the different projects that they're looking at, at doing for 2018 and 19, just like we did last year. Um, 2020, 21, 22 are out there. Um, they don't have, they're, they're placeholders, but they're not that they're set in stone that we're going to be doing those. And th those dollars are a little bit um, more speculative uh, as far as whether or not uh, that dollar amount is going to come through. Kathy, so um, the 2018 projects, uh, the ones that we are not funding through either grants or the enterprise funds, are we looking at a, if we were to accept all of these, are we looking at a one-year borrow or are you looking at a, I mean, do we need to be looking at 18 and 19 or just 18? I'm, I'm, I'm able to uh, cash flow, uh, depending on the size of the projects uh, and the, the loan, I'm able to fund uh, with a, uh, and keep the bar, keep the debt service levy uh, at, a, at the level it is at, at 1.3 million by doing a one-year note for the smaller items that normally if if we had the levy capacity we would put those into the general fund instead of doing a one-year note like the squad cars um, the IT uh, um, there's ten thousand dollars worth of some improvements at City Hall those smaller projects uh, weren't just a one-year blip it, you know, a borrow as if putting it on the credit card um, and paying only two and a quarter percent of interest from the state. You know, to get around with levy limit law, that's that seems to be the easiest for us to do at this point in time. One, because we don't have the levy capacity for our general operating budget to increase it. So we can increase the levy for debt service, but by um, doing some of the uh, prepayments that we've done, I've been able to do, to afford these one year notes um, with, for some of the, most of the equipment. Uh, the bigger borrow would be for, um, like we did late, there were, we're gonna be funding Lake Street. Lake Street is going to be a five year uh, state trust fund loan. To just spread it out over, um, the life of the asset, but not too far out so that you're paying $5,000 in principal on a $500,000 note for 10 years. The interest rate is um, much lower if you can do it at um, five year, it's only three and a quarter and, uh, or no, it's two and a half. And then that way um, we can have that debt paid off sooner and, and, lo and be able to lower the tax levy instead of keep stringing it um, out for a long period. And you'll see that once um, I start discussing the, 
um, debt service levy and how funding these projects um, with state trust fund loan where we can be very, um, as the um, gentleman from Baird had told you when they did the TIF um, refund, refunding um, mechanism is that we can dictate to the state trust fund how we want that debt to be paid off. If I can't pay um, in five e equal installments to begin with, I can back end that debt uh, to help it bl blend in with what our tax levy is. And that's pretty much what I, I'm doing with um, uh, 18 and 19 and 17's um, debt is to get us blended so that when in 19 when the Hendrickson Center debt drops off and, and, and frees up a half a million dollars of debt service levy that I can pay off some other debt faster and still stay in that 1.3 million debt service levy. And let me ask those two. Um, so 1.3 is what, tell me again, it's the maximum we could do or we could go higher I'm just asking. Oh, we can go higher. I can, I'll show you, uh, I, I have that information, but I thought I would just have the departments next to, you know, go over uh, each of those unless you would like me to show you how I'm going to fit all this stuff that they've, all these can, projects. That's fine. You can go in your direction. I just want to, in my mind, understand. So if we went less, so let's say we went a million dollars instead of a million three, would that reduce our tax levy? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. If if I didn't have three hundred thousand, we would reduce the the tax levy by about ten cents. Okay. So, um, but we do have some projects in, from seventeen that uh, with uh, in regards to Main Street that we've already approved contracts for that we're, we're going to be borrowing for yet this year. Um, because we are in the third quarter, almost fourth quarter for bonding with the state, we get a 18 month um, holdover that our first principal payment isn't until 18 months. So we don't have to pay a principal payment. We'll pay interest, um, but um, we don't have to pay uh, for 18 months in a, a, a debt payment um, by not borrowing until October of um, the year. And that's um, kind of um, using like capitalized interest uh, for, for borrowing just to make everything work. So um, do you want to, um, we'll go down to City Hall and Library, the Council Chambers technology upgrade Josh, do you want to come out and Good thing the door is unlocked. Um, we're looking to do a couple things in this room uh, next year. The first, the laptops you have in front of you are about six years old, give or take, and that's a pretty good life for a computer. So as we did six years ago, these laptops would get released to you to keep and we'd get new devices um, for viewing packets. We're exploring different options for that, maybe having a permanent device in this room that all the committees and groups could utilize. Um, you know, nothing's been finalized on that. Um, some other upgrades in this room, probably about a third of the microphones in here do not work well anymore. You probably pick up or not pick up on that as you talk. So the ones in poor shape would get replaced. Um, I know there's been some talk that maybe the projector screen is hard to see for some people, maybe in inconvenient spots. We might be looking at mounting a couple TVs in here to make presentations easier to see. So those are the main things in here. Two other projects related to this room that we'll evaluate. Um, one would be getting an electronic voting system in here. That would depend on what the cost of a system like that would look like. And the other one would be some sort of meeting management software. So we'll kind of work through that project in stages and see what makes sense to do and what's the right direction to go in for that. 
You want to hit the phone system for 19? I thought it was a 2020 project. I right. got moved up. Okay. Um, okay. Well, the phone system that we have in this building and at the police department was put in, I believe, in 2008 or 2009. So by the time we get to 2019, we'll have 10 years of life out of that. Um, due to a power surge, the server here died that we just had replaced, but the one at the PD probably have been using longer than we should, um, just due to age and basically it being a computer and uh, not being up to date anymore on the hardware. Um, the other issue with the phone system are the phones are getting pretty old. I've had to replace, I don't know, probably eight to ten phones since I've been here that have just died or have had issues and that's going to continue. And it's a pretty dated system. Um, a new system would be a VoIP based phone system voice over IP. Um, better standard to work with, the more up to date gives us more flexibility on placement of the phone. And part of that replacement project would be kind of rewiring the whole building because we've got old uh, phone cables in here and we'd have to update that to CAT6 cable to support a new phone system. Um, the current vendor we're with, um, it's been a pretty stable system, but one of the disadvantages is it's very proprietary. If any hardware dies, we're at their mercy to get something new shipped waiting for it. I can't go on Amazon and have something here the next day. Um, I can't call directly to support through that company. I have to go through our local vendor that we work with to get to support. Um, you have to be certified to actually talk to the support people for the phone system. So this would be a good chance to just really evaluate what phone system we have and, and get something that better meets our needs, has better support options, and hopefully maybe some lower cost with software upgrades and the like. And the server room air conditioner? Oh, yeah. A couple of years ago, we consolidated all of the IT equipment into the electrical room here at City Hall. A lot of the equipment was located in areas that were a lot more public. Um, so there were concerns with the security of our equipment just because of what it is, um, because of what it contains. There's a lot of private information on there, a lot of police department data on there. And just having it in general storage rooms that the public could potentially get access to with a door being left open or just anyone could walk in and go by was not a good, uh, good uh, place to be. Um, a lot of the wiring in the building was already running through that room, so it made sense to consolidate in there. And as we've increased equipment, um, that room continues to get warmer and warmer. Um, when we had the HVAC system redone in this building, I think, uh, one of the things that got corrected turned out to be a bad side uh, effect in that room. It got warmer in there, and I think that was just part of correcting the system. I think it stayed cooler in there due to some maybe issues. And right now there's a portable, small portable air conditioner, and they're keeping it right around 80 degrees. Um, and I only anticipate over time probably more equipment going in there as we move to more technology and more things. So I'd like to evaluate getting a permanently placed air conditioner in there, one that has proper drainage and other things to keep the equipment in that room in good shape. Justin. The facility's pickup truck, so it's the pickup truck that Russ Montgomery typically drives around day in and day out. Uh, the story on this is when Russ came from Park and Rec to Public Works, uh, we gained an employee and also his truck. So he came over with the truck from Park and Rec. So that truck he's driving around used to be a Park and Rec truck. So what we'd like to do now is replace that truck so Russ would get a new truck or Public Works would get a new truck and uh, the existing truck would go back to Park and Rec. So there is uh, really no resale value. It's just got to be given back to Park and Rec so that they can use it uh, within their fleet. So the truck's in pretty good working order right now. It would uh, fit them pretty well. <coughs> um, the City Hall office workspaces, we tried um, looking at um, putting it for this year and um, we're going to be going out for proposals for this in, in 18. So uh, we will not be borrowing for it in, in se on 17's note. No, we'll be borrowing it instead on, on 18 note, no, and that's to replace all of the old um, clerical typewriter desks that um, staff is using uh, up in the clerk and uh, finance and admin offices uh, instead of... Um, ergonomically correct uh, desks and chairs. So we've just delayed it 
uh, another year. <clears throat> and Josh, do you want to come out and do the computer update? I'm told not to talk too long. Um, we pay for our annual computer replacements out of capital. Next year, we're looking at replacing community media, a couple computers at City Hall, and uh, probably about half the computers in our computer lab at the Senior Center. Some of the computers that are still in okay shape will get sold off. Some will get reused in the park system, and some will probably just go into the recycling pile. So I'm looking at replacing probably around a dozen 14 computers next year. Thank you. You want to do Parks and Rec with uh, um, I think you're in the Park and Rec building. Do you want me to skip to that? I think it's Rec Center, yeah. There it is. Um, we're looking at doing two projects in the rec center. One will start this fall winter, and that will be replacing our security cameras, and that ties into this access control project, uh, the key fob system, just like we have in place here at City Hall and the police department. It allows staff or just volunteers or public users of the building to have a key card to get access so we know who's coming and going. We can schedule the unlocking and locking of the doors. Um, and all the security benefits that come with that. So we're looking at doing that to all the exterior doors at the rec center. I think that opens more opportunities to allow the public to use the building outside of normal hours. Um, increases security there. Um, so we're going to be starting over the winter with cameras, getting all the wiring, getting all the infrastructure in place, and then uh, putting the hardware on the doors next year. Andrew, you want to cover Park and Rec? All right, as you can see, uh, Aaron is not here. I believe he's hunting elk today, so he sent me. Um, first one on there, Riverside Park Restoration Project. Um, this uh, amount on here is a maximum amount. Some of this goes into the DNR having a say in the price based on their workload uh, for the year. What we're having issues with here. Um, if you're driving past the park where it bends back towards you and through the park, um, a lot of times, especially this year when we're having a lot of water, uh, it's cutting through there. We're having a lot of erosion issues and um, bank issues and just taking away from the general uh, recreational value of the park. So um, DNR we're working with to get that corrected um, with a certain, uh, couple certain things that they want to do. Um, that land is on private property. Um, luckily, I know the owner very, very well, and we will work with her to um, try to get that done and uh, keep the value of the park uh, there for the recreation. If you drive by there, you see a lot of people fishing, boats, um, kayaks, all sorts of things, so we want to make sure we keep that in good order. Uh, next thing on there, Lakeman Field Concession Building. Uh, uh, we did talk about the Lakeman uh, playing there earlier. Uh, but we do have uh, a lot of other games there as well. So we have Legion games, uh, Babe Ruth games. That field gets used a, a lot in the summer. Uh, the concession building right now has a couple issues. It has ADA issues. Uh, so the bathrooms are unusable uh, to people uh, with certain disabilities and uh, also some deterioration issues there. Um, as as uh, Dave noted before, we did rent some portable toilets, and some of those had to be uh, ADA um, to keep, you know, we're, we're probably supposed to have those there uh, more often. Um, as we work towards getting a plan with that and working on that uh, amount, um, it sounds like there may be a possible financial donation through the Lakeman to help with this project as we move forward. Uh, the next one is replace the rake machine. So this is the machine that we use to 
um, smooth out, rake all the fields each day during the summer. Uh, that consists of six to seven fields each day, uh, pretty much every day uh, in the end of May, June, and July as we have tournaments on the weekends and other places. So this machine is falling apart and has issues and is very old, so it um, definitely needs to be replaced there. Next one, Swan Park Relamp Field Lights. Um, again, we've looked at these, had them tested, uh, and they are very dim for today's competitive standards. Uh, and a lot of that is they're just getting old and outdated. Um, so just relamping those and not replacing anything with the poles or anything like that. Um, so we'd have a company come in and do that. Serenity Park Boardwalk Accessible Trail. So Serenity Park is the park that is right behind the rec center. Um, as you go across the bridge, you can see it down on the right. So right across from the blue door that you go in the senior center. If you haven't looked down there, Sarah has done a tremendous job at updating that and making it look nice. I believe they're working on a mural this week along the wall. So um, so really neat stuff happening down there. So check that out. Uh, another thing is uh, possibly building a 50 yard stretch um, along the river with two fishing platforms coming out from it. Uh, the expectation uh, that one half of that amount, I believe Aaron stated, um, would be through donations is the goal there. Um, and so it's just, a, again, accessibility to the river. Uh, it's becoming a very nice park. It is used and uh, we wanna keep building that park up uh, to make it a, a pristine park in the city. Um, Seasonal truck replacement. Um, Justin here kind of talked on that a little bit. What we're looking to do here is not buy new trucks. Uh, we have three trucks listed there, 419, 411. I see 404 is out a little bit of ways. Um, but we're looking to uh, possibly try to sell our vehicles, uh, which are really uh, getting beat up over the years. And we're gonna take over, as he talked about, some of the street department trucks as they get new ones. Um, so I'm gonna assume that um, the first one is the one that he was talking about um, for us to kind of take back and then try to sell ours. So that's what we're trying to do there, um, not buy new vehicles. And those are the trucks that haul the lawnmowers around, the rake machine, all the different parks and everything throughout the summer. Next one on there, replace Lakeman Field light poles. Um, this is something that uh, Aaron Fields needs to be done very soon. Uh, the current poles, to give you a little backstory, were put in during the late 70s. Um, they were put in with a 30 year life expectancy. I am not a math major, but I know we are past 30 years uh, by quite a long shot. Um, we are in the process, uh, he is in the process of finding someone to take core samples. I know he's been in, in talks with uh, public service, uh, trying to take core samples of the eight poles to test the integrity. Uh, our biggest concern is not necessarily the part of the pole that you see, but the part underneath the ground. Um, and we're gonna try to see if we can get that tested as well. Um, project needs to be uh, likely done in the next five years, depending on how the tests go. Um, so this, you know, some will go, some of this will depend on those tests, I believe. Uh, Aaron is also in talks, uh, just to give you a little bit more on it, uh, with the school district. Uh, obviously, they built a new field. They have the Habercorn field there with four light poles. Um, he has been in talks with them to possibly repurpose those. Lakeman Field would be a good fit for that. I know there's eight poles at Lakeman Field right now, um, but it would be a start. Um, he's also talked to, uh, um, what is the light place in, why we got TLC? TLC, TLC, yes. Um, to see how that would work for us, what that would cost to move them and get them over there, uh, depending on how some of those tests come back. Uh, so that's kind of, kind of an important uh, project there as we, you know, could be getting into safety issues depending on how those poles look as they move forward. Do you want to that. touch on the rec building then? Senior center, yeah. Uh, last one in the next two years would be the senior center office. Um, as I stated before, Sarah has made some changes, some great changes, and she's doing a wonderful job down there. Part of um, what she did was uh, move her 
quote unquote office area out towards the front. So she's more accessible, more there for the um, seniors and the members who are there. Um, part of that was that it was just an open space and um, not that we're having a ton of issues, but there are some issues there with privacy as she may talk to people about private things um, when other people can be walking by. Uh, the other issue there is security. Uh, unfortunately, she's had a couple things taken um, from her uh, office area and not necessarily by senior members, um, but other people do get down there sometimes. And so what they're trying to do is enclose that area so that she's still accessible to the members, uh, but can have a place in private to talk to people if needed, and also to keep uh, equipment secure. Some of that equipment is computers that the, you know, are owned by the city. So we need to make sure that stuff is uh, staying secure. And then Josh had already talked about the access control, which also uh, kind of includes the um, updating possibly the cameras. Our camera system in there is very old and outdated and sitting, taking up half my office. And um, I think, you know, some of the camera systems that we have in the parks that I can look up on my phone at any time would be a better uh, resource there uh, as we do have, unfortunately, some issues there and, and try to help the police department sometimes as well um, with those cameras. And it's really tough with the cameras that we have now. Uh, and I believe that's it for the next two years. Ryan, Christopher, on the building. The building? Yeah. Carpet. <coughs> well, the backup. All right, so we're looking at the backup boiler. No. Um, we're, we're, we're just going to, you just got the carpet. All right, I keep my glasses. I'm going in to get them redone. <laughs> <laughs> so the carpeting we're looking at in, uh, in the department we have in the squad room, we've had that since the building. Um, was redone and with the tracking of the officers going back and forth and everything that is getting wore out and also in the front office area so we're looking at replacing the front office where people walk in in the squad room um, everything else is is fine inside the department so we're looking at replacing that next year um, going to squad cars squad cars so right now, with our fleet, we're on a five-year rotation with the squad cars. Um, we have a 2011 and a 2013. Those squads are going to have over 120,000 miles on them. And what we've been experiencing with those cars, with the miles and being in the city, we've had a lot of maintenance that um, has had to be done with the cars. Um, as I spoke last year, we're... Um, trying to get on a better rotation of replacing those cars. Um, right now, like I said, it's at five years. I'm hoping over the next um, five to six years, we're able to return those cars um, after four years that we can keep the, um, the maintenance cost and everything done with the squads. And what comes with that is um, when, we, when we order the cars of putting the new equipment inside each of the cars um, over the last few years we've had to replace light bars that have fallen off the squads that we've replaced every year and with how um, the equipment and the technology continues to change that we need to continue to have the updated equipment in the, in the squads with the radios and with the computers to be able to communicate um, back and forth um, so we're looking at, and then also um, in the October meeting, the, I believe it's the October 17th meeting, I'll be looking at coming forward to asking permission um, if we can go ahead and order those cars. If we do so by October 31st, we will get 2017 pricing on those squads. Um, last year we did that, and we saved I think about 1500 to $2,000 um, for that car by ordering ahead of time and we also got that squad earlier too we got that at the end of January instead of waiting till March and running the cars even longer your forensic phone analysis yes as technology seems to be um, really striving in law enforcement um, one of the things that we don't have is we don't have the ability to download cell phones and most of the crimes that we investigate 
that we go to, everybody uses social media. They use text messages. They use um, their cameras for photographing videos. The only way that we can go through those phones at the police department right now is to manually go through those phones and try to find items. If things are deleted, we are not able to find those items. Um, so in the last probably two years, we have taken phones over to the sheriff's department um, and they have done some for us. However, they are backlogged. We have driven phones over to the New London Police Department um, to use their equipment, we have to um, wait for them to get there to download everything and extract the reports for us. And it makes it very easy for us once um, we get those reports that we can go through there and we can look for items that we that may have been deleted. Um, so it actually will assist us with our investigations and speed up our investigations, which should. Um, cut overtime and hours spent just in analyzing phones. Um, so that's that's something that we're looking at and I had spoken with a company called Cellubrite and um, we shouldn't have to have any other equipment that, that needs to be ordered. This would all be within, um, within their cost and anything else that would need to be done, we would just absorb that into our budget. Peg, the wall. Um, so we're um, coming kind of to the end of our our um, renovations in the library, and one of the things we are still considering is the automatic materials processing. There isn't currently any room in the back room, so we do have 10,000 as a placeholder for this next year to consider moving the back wall behind the circulation desk forward to accommodate that equipment. Um, our funding will come completely from our library foundation and from other donations for that um, project. department all right so in this coming year we'd like to get a new snow plow uh, we have a couple of them uh, and one of them in particular is getting of age it's over 10 years old uh, so we'd like to replace it uh, while we can still get some value for the existing one. Uh, so you can see it's a pretty pricey piece of equipment, but, you know, invaluable come uh, winter time. Uh, we're also looking to replace a pickup truck. Uh, now, that's a little bit higher than usual. That truck is actually the street superintendent, Roger Hansen's truck. It's a quad cab. Uh, the reason for this truck to be on here uh, is because the online department uh, definitely, definitely needs new vehicles. Uh, the online vehicle currently is in terrible shape. Um, <clears throat> so this would be a truck that would be, uh, I guess, turned over to the online uh, department. So we would replace, we'd basically be selling the current uh, quad cab uh, and turning it over to online, and then we'd have to replace that that truck uh, here next year. Uh, and then 2019, we're looking at replacing the snowblower. Now that's just a piece of equipment, uh, a large piece of equipment that fits on the front end of a truck that we uh, utilize for downtown uh, for snow removal. We can't wing it off the sides. We got businesses, uh, so we have to blow it into a truck and, and uh, truck it out of the, well, out of the downtown. So it comes in very handy. We're also looking to replace a small dump truck. Uh, again, a truck that's well over 10 years of age, showing its wear. Uh, a truck we use quite a bit for asphalt, topsoil, uh, a number of operations. Uh, and again, just uh, trading it in uh, so we can still get some uh, value out of it. So with those vehicles, we have some money in reserves from uh, prior purchases. Uh, that we would utilize uh, to help lighten the, the blow a little bit. Uh, we have a land purchase coming up next year we'd like to explore. I'm not sure how much detail I can get into tonight or if that. Um, I know, just say that it's for the public works garage. Public works garage. It's, yeah, we're looking at land purchase for, for future uh, location of a public works facility. 
so for many, many years, uh, my predecessor, John Edelbeck, was working on a uh, facility. Uh, we think we have a solution, and I'll be bringing something forward to you shortly uh, that involves a land purchase. <clears throat> So street rehab uh, in the future, Main Street, you all know about that, uh, and that's going to take uh, quite a bit of funding, as you can see in the next several years, uh, as far as design and reconstruction. Uh, we have, uh, well, moving about halfway down the City Hall Library parking lot, which was a project that was approved not too long ago. Uh, we're working on that right now uh, with Brennan and the consultants. Uh, but the two other streets we have in between or before Main Street is Evans Street and Granite Street. Um, I would like to get Evans Street done in 19, start design next year and get it done 19. Uh, the only hitch to that is it might have to be pushed back because I'll be most likely seeking funding through the DOT, uh, much like the STP program, uh, but through a different program, which would be about an 80-20 split. If that happens, it would push the program or the, the road project back to 2020. Uh, so we'll be seeking that funding. Uh, and if we do qualify, we get it. Evans would move back a couple years and Granite Street would move up. Uh, you can see they're both on the list and they're both expensive roadways. Uh, the issue with Evans Street is we have very narrow road uh, right away. Uh, and we're looking to accommodate better pedestrian and bicycle facilities. So we only have a 22 foot wide road there with no shoulders, uh, no curb, and we're looking to definitely improve that. And when you do that, we need more room. So we're anticipating some land acquisition and definitely uh, a pretty intensive design, uh, as you can see from the dollar amount, uh, $132,000, kind of expecting for design. Uh, Granite Street, a uh, little bit different uh, road is definitely in need of repair. We have quite a bit of storm sewer that needs improvement, quite a bit of curb and gutter that needs to be replaced, quite a bit of sidewalk that needs to be replaced, uh, along with some uh, water work. So that would be the lofty uh, price on Granite Street as well. And then a new item on the list near the bottom is the fire department apron. Um, Roger and myself have been working on this quite a bit and trying to figure out how we can make this work within our budget. And at that price, we're looking at replacing all the concrete from basically the, the police department building all the way up to uh, Franklin Street. Uh, so it'd be all that concrete, including the sidewalk and the curb. We'd improve some drainage. And of course, it's really rough and bumpy for the trucks. Um, it's it's expensive because we need a beefier pavement there to handle these heavy fire trucks loaded up with water. Uh, and finally to note, our crews would be doing that work. Our city uh, street crews would be doing that. So that's a big cost savings right there. If we were to hire it out, you could probably expect that number to double. You want to touch on the downtown alley reconstruction because the engineering's in 19? I missed that one. <clears throat> uh, the back alleyways on downtown, so they mirror the uh, Main Street project we're doing. We're looking to see if we could fit that in as well. Um, that is pretty bare bones number, so if we just kind of uh, do some basic repairs with uh, some storm sewer and just repave it, we could probably make that fit. Um, but we're looking into it. That price might increase if we want to do something a little more... Um, Little, a little better, little bit better of a situation behind the alleyways, but I think we can get it done with that dollar amount right there. Justin, you want to talk about Evans Street and the detour because of the bridge? <coughs> yeah. Or... Um, so the reason Evans Street, we'd like to get Evans Street constructed in 2019, because next year, 2018, the Berlin Bridge right next to Bethany there will be replaced. That's a county project. Um, and that's actually on here. I didn't discuss it. It's a, we have a cost share on that project, uh, which notes that 50000 I don't think we'll need that much, but it's just a little earmark. Uh, be, that should be more than enough for, for our share of that project. So while that is going on in 2018, the bridge will be out. Um, Evans Street will be a detour right, route. So uh, County Highway E to Evans to Churchill is basically the route around that bridge. So 
we're expecting pretty heavy traffic loads on, on uh, Evans Street, and it's already in really poor shape. So we were targeting 2019 so that as soon as this detour season was done, we could get on it the next year and, and replace it. Um, but like I mentioned before, if we can uh, secure an 80% cost share from the DOT, I think that would be enough um, to warrant pushing it back an extra year. But uh, that remains to be seen at this point. Anyone yeah, for the transit? transit? Yeah, it's in my notes here. Um, <clears throat> well, our fleet is um, aging. We, uh, can you hear me okay? Um, many of the vehicles that we're currently using, we were uh, able to acquire with federal stimulus money, and they're beginning uh, to wear. Um, if you remember a month or so ago, you authorized the purchase of a taxi, um, a, a, a van with a uh, handicap accessible lift. And the way these grants work, you apply for them and you got two years to spend them. And the purchase you authorized the last month was with 2016 grant money. For 2017, we applied for a capital grant and we received that. So we've got one capital grant that we can use to replace uh, two vehicles that are planned to be replaced in 2018. Uh, when I come for, before you annually to get permission to apply for the transit funds, there will be a request for a, a, a capital grant again uh, for 2018 that would provide the funding to replace uh, two vehicles. We've got two Crown Vicks uh, with uh, 155,000 and 167,000 miles on them. And you can see that a majority of the uh, cost is going to be borne by um, uh, grants. And this number 13 might be one of those short-term borrows as you and package those as, this all together. And one-year notes, yes. Yeah, would be, yeah, be kind of lumped in with the squad cars. Uh, in 2019, uh, the King bus would be proposed to be replaced. Um, and uh, that would be a medium bus. And again, those are a little more expensive vehicles. Uh, and again, I think we're kind of in a pattern where we're going to do short-term borrows for some of these lower uh, cost items. And so, uh, again, very similar in a, in a match uh, situation. So, um, again, we try to get on a good replacement schedule with our vehicles because they do get a lot of use. <clears throat> this water treatment. Okay, so first item is the cathodic protection. Um, we had two list stations we did that on just recently, uh, and it was kind of a trial to see how things went, and we got a good taste of, I guess, of how these systems work, fitting them out. We ran into a few issues, ironed them out, um, so we know what to expect, and we're just going to be looking to do that to the rest of our underground uh, metal list stations. So we did two. We got um, three more to go. One of them is within um, the Foxfire area. So learning from the last one of having a noisy pump next to it, uh, we're gonna apply that to this area and try and get it done uh, when golf is not in season. The wastewater treatment plant also has a pickup truck they'd like to be looking to replace. Uh, and this truck uh, is also one that would be going to online. Um, so online needs two vehicles now that they got their uh, grant lined up to expand the broadband. Uh, so this would be another one of those vehicles that would be going uh, to that. Uh, this truck is used uh, by, the, by the wastewater treatment plant crew uh, for snow plowing uh, and a number of other things. It's got a lift on it. <clears throat> uh, we are going to get a safety grant uh, about for $1,500 to put on a, a tailgate lift. Uh, to help with some of the heavier equipment that they move around. Water. Water. Oh, still going on. Or you want to go with school? Um, DC plant DCS distribution distributed control system is basically our controls 
in the plant. You go up to a, what looks like a TV screen or monitor. They push some buttons. It tells them uh, how the pumps are running, how things are running within the plant. We'd like to upgrade that. It's, it's fairly old. It uh, is actually touchscreen technology, um, but we're kind of running out of room as things evolve uh, and uh, technology improves. So that would be something a couple years out, uh, pretty pricey, uh, pretty high price tag for the treatment plant. Uh, one we'd like to get done next year is repainting a couple of the building floors, 8,000, 9,000 building, which is basically our, our digesters and sludge buildings. Uh, we don't have carpeting. We just have concrete floors that are painted, and they wear out over time as well. So <clears throat> it's actually a, a fairly efficient fix of, of uh, uh, blasting off the old paint, replacing. Uh, it's a safety improvement. You know, they, they wear out. They kind of skid. They slip. So this would be an improvement on that. Um, GBT block wall. That's a gravity belt thickener. Um, we have a device in our sludge building that the <coughs> sludge is basically ran over the top uh, and it thickens it. So you run this pretty heavy sewage over it. It thickens it. Uh, well, it's a process, but the main thing of it is it was put in in 1997 uh, and is out of code safety-wise. We need to have better ventilation in this room, so the block wall uh, would help with that. We'd uh, replace or improve a block wall that's there, increase our ventilation, so it's, it's basically a safety improvement uh, for our operators in the plant. Moving down to water, we have the meter replacement program um, that we'll be continuing to work on. Now, looking forward, this was this is what we would need to swap out all of our uh, old obsolete meters uh, and kind of upgrade the current ones that are compatible uh, with the Beacon software. Now, to remind you, the Beacon software is the uh, software that Basically, the meter talks to the billing department with a text message. Um, so that would be replacing the old ones that don't have that capability uh, in tying on some new um, technology onto the uh, compatible ones so that they can communicate that way. And we're doing this because we think there'd be a lot of efficiencies gained here uh, from our operators uh, up to the billing department of these continual reads. Uh, it'd also be able to provide information uh, to uh, the users. I mean, sitting at home, you can see exactly what your water usage is uh, hour by hour. So we think that'd be a big positive to help cut down on, on complaints, uh, identify issues early on, so we're really excited about it. Uh, but with the project, we're looking at uh, doing a rate increase uh, for next year. Now, this would be what we're proposing, a 3% increase on just the usage. Uh, so it would be on your 1,000 um, gallons per use, it would be a 3% increase on just that dollar amount. Nothing on the meter charge or uh, the fire charge or the sewer charge. None of those numbers would increase just the usage. Uh, the reason is um, as we upgrade um, each text message that's, each unit that has this capability of sending a text message uh, increases our cost by 58 cents per month. So that would basically cover that additional cost. Um, so we would continue to roll out. After the project's over, then we'd probably be seeking a, a full rate increase uh, several years down the road. And I believe the last rate increase was back in 2011? 11. 11. 11. So we're six years. We've about due to, to do a rate increase uh, just on a normal scale anyways. Quick question on that, Justin. Are you doing these meter replacements now? Yes. Okay. We're, we're replacing meters now. Um, we haven't switched anybody over to the new software yet. Uh, we've tried it on our meters, the city's meters that we, uh, the water department charges other city facilities as a trial, but we have not switched people over, but we're upgrading the meters and replacing them. I now. asked because mine was replaced just uh, within like the last couple of weeks. Yep. Yep, so that one should be compatible. Um, they may have to come back in and put in a cell point, which would be the, the way that it talks cellular at some point to finish the upgrade. So we have a couple well rehabs 
uh, on the docket for the next couple of years. So well, three in six next year. Um, we've done that recently. Uh, just last year we did uh, two and four. So next year we would be doing wells uh, three and six. And again, that's have it, hiring a company to come in, uh, take the motor, take the pump, strip it down, uh, rehab it, uh, clean out the borehole, and televise it, make sure everything's on the up and up. It's basically a tune-up for your vehicle, but for a well. Um, so we got three and six next year, and then in 2019 we'd have five, seven, and eight. And then the next few items that are on the capital plan, the hydrant painting, leak location, the cross-connectional control, those are all built into our O&M, our operations and maintenance program. Uh, they're just listed here because they are higher dollar amount uh, tickets. So uh, the hydrant painting we take out of our, our hydrant uh, maintenance line, uh, same thing with the other uh, leak location and cross-connection. And then while PAC Online will be getting the one of the trucks um, from uh, Public Works, and this is the amount of money that um, Wapaka Online will be paying for that used truck. And then that's that's all the equipment that we are looking um, for um, 18 and 19. And <clears throat> again, it just I've given you several different uh, ways of looking at um, where the funding's coming from and we, where the um, items are being purchased. But I'm sure this is the information that um, the mayor is look, talking about. Um, this is our current outstanding debt is the blue. And you saw these um, Give some review here. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> so the blue is our current levy supported um, debt. And you see uh, it's right now about $4 million outstanding in debt. And it goes down to about 2023, and all of our geo tax levy supported debt is paid off. The orange is the TIF-related debt. Um, and that uh, portion uh, is going to be paid off, and it goes out even farther than 2023. The gray is um, the capital uh, for 2017 to 2021 and what that debt service uh, would be looking at outstanding and then 20 um, and then the gold is Main Street's rehab project um, where we have a little bit of debt and then as 2021 and 22 comes in that's when most of our costs come on and then the pub City Hall and Library parking lot project. I kind of broke them out a little bit because um, Main Street and the library are, um, and the City Hall Library project we've kind of already touched with, but the gray is kind of where we're going to be funding um, the projects that you saw. And this is where we are. In 2016, we ended up with, a, we're st we still had outstanding one, $11 million worth of debt. Uh, in 17, we will end up with um, only $10 million uh, worth of debt, uh, even though we'll be issuing another um, about $700,000 worth of debt for the Main Street Rehab Project, the engineering and design contracts that you approved, the design of the City Hall parking lot, and uh, the capital projects that you've already approved uh, for Lake Street and uh, some of the other equipment. So that's, that includes that debt, um, less what we've already paid off. Uh, we have a capacity of 18.7 million uh, under the state and under the city, we have 14.8 million. Uh, we have a remaining balance of 8 million to borrow 
at the end of this year under the state and 4.5 um, for our city limits. In 18, um, again, because of what we're paying off and only putting back on, you, you, we are still continuing to lower our debt. Um, it would be only 9.7 million, uh, 19 would be nine. Even though 2021, uh, we would be bringing on um, not only the road projects, but um, Main Street, you're looking at only 7 million in outstanding debt. And that just keeps going down. And 2023, all of our levy supported debt will be paid off. Our previous, um, prior to 2017. So we'll have no outstanding debt in 2023 um, for prior, but our current five year capital plan, um, we are looking at um, having. Um, probably about two or three million out there um, for um, projects out, outstanding debt. So you're looking at in 2023 um, of having a less than five million outstanding debt, uh, which is good because that means our debt service levy is going down. Um, with smoothing some, and I got to smooth that little little spike in 2021, um, but I, I believe that we can um, continue with the projects and still pay off debt early um, and continue to borrow and, and still reduce the, that tax levy. So even though we're at 1.3 million, um, we might be less than, um, maybe 2.5 million, I believe, for 2018, uh, if we don't uh, have a recommendation to continue to leave it and pay off more debt, so that bl light blue section can go away faster than 2023. It can and it can go um, probably sooner than than later. But the biggest drop um, for the light blue section is because we pay off the Hendrickson because of the refinancing that we did on the debt. We pay off the Hendrickson Center next year with um, $500,000 worth of um, tax levy for debt service and that goes away. Um, and we aren't filling up that hole with additional 500,000. Uh, it'll be less than that. Uh, so, um, I could see that um, going forward that even though there might be a little spike and I can smooth, we can look at smoothing that is that we'll continue to have that debt service tax levy go down to where it was in previous years, which the tax levy was less than 400,000 a year um, and much, much more manageable um, f for the projects that we have coming up. So that's it. Any questions? Kathy, in the gray, though, you have accounted for the public works facility, or that's beyond? Oh, no. There's that's, no public works facility in this. That's in 2023. <laughs> it, 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 it could fit in. Like I said, if we did a public works facility, it would have to be in 2024 after the current um, the current outstanding debt was paid off. So once that light blue is gone, that's when I would be, make a recommendation that you would do. We would look at at, at borrowing for a, a public works facility. That that and the fact is that you'll have uh, about three or four years of Main Street, uh, and I can I'm pretty I'm trying to be a little bit more aggressive than a um, 10 year note on Main Street because it is only for 1.3 million that we're borrowing. Um, I might be able to get that down to like a six or seven year note. Um, or we can use it as, as you know, we can have it at 10 and, and if it's a state trust fund loan or even if we went on GO, have some call provisions that, and we know in 2024 we can start calling on some of those bonds. 
and and be able to pay off Main Street sooner so that we can um, um, keep the debt de 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 service tax levy down. But that's one of my goals is to to reduce that tax levy um, totally uh, so that it's it, there isn't that burden on on the taxpayers and we're still doing um, over five five hundred thousand dollars worth of public works uh, roads to maintain the amount um, for state transportation aids so that we don't lose it so any questions thanks Kathy somebody want to hit the lights please thank you Dave Okay, um, nice job, Kathy, uh, staff. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to know where we're uh, sitting and what you are thinking. Uh, obviously, council members, uh, if you have questions about the projects that uh, have been brought forward to you or if you don't see a project that you thought was going to be on there, you know, let the uh, department heads know. Uh, this is not obviously a final uh, decision we're still working on the budget yet uh, the next phase of the budget is what Henry and, and when? yeah the uh, October 3rd uh, we're going to be talking about personnel um, we should have uh, some information on um, health insurance renewal uh, maybe some uh, discussion on raises potential raises if we can work those in the budget I think back in early spring a council wanted us to look at some uh, longevity pay options and that'll be something we'll talk about as well so okay that'll be in a month so again uh, keep in mind uh, the projects that you, I know it came by you fairly quickly and and you'll need time to digest it but uh, don't be afraid to ask questions if you have questions about what you've seen tonight uh, and uh, <coughs> moving forward with that too but anything else for the good of the committee the whole meeting we, we need a motion to adjourn, to adjourn. Motion, by, motion by Keelan second by fair that we adjourn till our next we adjourn any discussion <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Brewers are losing 2 1.